I'm going to connect these speakers to this battery to see how high they can launch the ping pong ball. Then discuss how speakers work and why they behave differently when given the same signal. First, we'll see all these speakers being connected and disconnected from a 9 volt battery at 960 frames per second. This makes the speaker move as quickly as it can and shows us the speaker's mechanical compliance. The cone that stops first has the best suspension because it can bring the cone to rest quicker. Second, we'll increase the voltage to 36 volts and add a switch that will short the voice coil right when the battery is disconnected to add the electrical compliance. We'll discuss that more in a minute, but now, why do speakers move when we connect a battery? Most speakers fundamentally work in the same way. There's a permanent magnet designed to focus its force into a small gap. This is the motor. A coil of insulated wire is wrapped around a former, which creates the voice coil. This former is then attached to the center of the cone. These parts are suspended in a frame by the surround and spider, so the voice coil is perfectly aligned with the magnet gap. The surround and spider keep the moving parts in a linear path from moving too far and brings them back to the resting position. When you apply voltage from the amplifier, current will flow in one direction, causing the voice coil to act like an electromagnet, either pushing away from the permanent magnet with positive voltage or pulling towards the magnet with negative voltage. Since the voice coil is attached to the cone, the whole assembly moves, compressing air and creating sound. This video shows the mechanical workings of a speaker much better than I could. It's linked in the description below. Although there are thousands in each one, there's four main categories of transducers. Subwoofers, woofers, midranges, and tweeters. Each category is specialized for reproducing a specific range of frequencies. As we've learned in the first video, low frequencies are really big waves, and it takes a lot of displacement and power to move enough air to reproduce these waves, but subwoofers, which can have up to a 30-inch diameter cone and handle up to 5,000 watts, are made to do just that. Speakers always have a power rating, something like 50 watts RMS, 100 watts peak. That means the voice coil can dissipate 50 watts worth of heat continuously and deal with short peaks of 100 watts before failure. Tweeters are the smallest since they play frequencies with shorter wavelengths. The biggest of tweeters are just 4 inch diameter and 280 watts, which is still big for something that's playing high frequencies, but tweeters have a different problem. They move such little air that there's an inefficiency between the air and the cone that makes achieving high outputs challenging. But compression drivers fix this inefficiency. They flip the dome over and implement a phase plug, which does a few things. It creates a tiny chamber where the air can be compressed, which corrects the coupling of the cone to the air. It time aligns the wave from a dome shape to a flat wave front by forcing it through gaps that all have the same length. And it reduces the overall area. So like a three inch diameter dome might be reduced down to a one inch throat. This design gives up to a 10 dB gain in output over a traditional tweeter with the same input power. Normally, to get that kind of gain, you would need 10 times the watts. So if you had a 10 watt amplifier and you wanted the speaker to be 10 dB louder, you would need a 100 watt amplifier. 10 dB is a substantial gain in output. This assembly is then typically attached to a horn for another gain in efficiency, and the horn then provides directivity. Woofers and mid-ranges are in between subwoofers and tweeters as far as physical size and power handling. But otherwise, they're similar. They're just reproducing a different frequency range. All of these transducers have a voice coil interacting with the permanent magnet, which has an inductive effect. Basically, when the voice coil is moving, at some point it needs to stop and go in the other direction, caused by a change in current flow from the amplifier. This change causes the voice coil to generate a magnetic field that resists the motion. Adding the voice coil mass and resistance to this inductance gives the speakers electrical compliance. The mechanical compliance comes from the surround and spider stiffness as well as the weight of the soft parts plus the weight of the air being acted on by the cone. These electrical and mechanical characteristics caused by the various materials, sizes, and weights of each component can be measured and are recorded as Thiel-Small parameters. 
Designers can use these parameters that are provided by the manufacturers to simulate how a transducer will perform in a given scenario, whether that's an open baffle, a sealed box, a ported box, or one of many other driver arrangements that are available. Each of these different arrangements will work best with a driver that has certain characteristics. This is one of the reasons there's so many different drivers. They're all designed to meet a certain performance level at a price point. A speaker's ability to reproduce sound, what we might call its transient response, comes down to how accurately the speaker cone can follow this line, because this is exactly the movements that the cone will need to replicate so that you hear the recorded sound as accurately as possible. A higher quality speaker, typically costing more, will provide better transient response over a wider range of frequencies and play louder. I used to joke with an old boss that with enough DSP, digital signal processing, you can stick any old speaker in a trash can and make it sound decent. But I don't think that anymore. So, that's what I got for you today. Thanks for joining me. Check out the products we make here at InPhase on our website, InPhase.us, and subscribe to be notified about upcoming product releases. And remember, sound is better in phase.